Hello, welcome back to 100 Days of Magic. I am your host, Donna Woodwell, and I'm here to give you a little mini tour, 15 minutes a day, of all of the elements of magic. Or at least all the elements of magic that I can fit into 15 minute little bite-sized pieces and share with you in a Facebook Live. I'm so glad that you are here, hung in this far today, Seven, yay, kudos to you. I know for all of us, this means building a magical habit. And let's face it, creating a spiritual practice, yes, having some ideas about it is awesome. Having some, some practical techniques to use is awesome. But really, a lot of it's just about showing up again and again and again. Showing up for yourself, showing up for your spirit spiritual practice and all of those things can slowly over time lead you to create the conditions in your life that you will feel the magic pulsing through you on a more regular basis all right so hello Boris for coming again I think you've been here every day I'm so proud of you if you're tuning in just to begin with that's awesome too. No matter where you are at the journey, there's always something you can learn in every moment of every day. But if you want to catch up on the back episodes, I've created a guide in this Facebook group, The Crossroads of Magic and Mastery, that has all of the past videos. Or you can just use the hashtag 100 Days of Magic and find all of the videos there. I think I have tagged them all. Hello, Jackie. Welcome, welcome. Uh, hello from a very stormy England, I see. Well, I'm jealous because this is a very not stormy Austin, Texas. And at least we've had a little bit of rain recently, so I can't feel too bad. And yay, here the summer is finally ending. But you didn't come here to hear me talk about the weather. You came here to talk about that fun title, Astrology and the Seven Governors. So. Over the last week, we have been talking about some theoretical things about magic. How magic comes from each one of us plugging into what's easy to call the vertical dimension. It's, it's nuance free, but basically it means plugging into the spiritual spark within you. Now, this week, we're going to talk about how the one turns into the many infinite things that we see around us. And in the ancient worldview, this is where the planets take on a special significance. In the Corpus Hermetica, they refer to the planets as the seven governors of the world. So what does that mean? Well, today we're familiar with the concept of a prism. You shine a white light into the prism where everything is unified and the prism splits up the light into all the colors of the rainbow. In essence, that is also the way the ancients thought about the planets and how they operated. That while underneath everything, there is a grand unified one spirit moving through everything, the planets were responsible for moving spirit down into physical manifestation by each taking over a part, an archetype, a color of manifestation, of our manifested reality. Shortcut version, it would be like if you gave God a box of seven crayons in order to say, hey, go color everything. That's the essence of what the planets meant. They were in charge of certain areas of physical manifestation. And their spinning back and forth, round and round and round, became like the swinging of a pendulum to mark both sides of our, uh, the polarities of our experience. So in essence, planets set at the, at the edge of stepping down the divine energy into physical manifestation. And because there are so many of them, well, seven at least to start with, the combination of how they move all those opposing pairs of polarities is what enabled all of this crazy diversity to occur 
in our physical manifestation. That's why we can still say today, two astrology charts have never been the same and two astrology charts can never be the same because all it takes is a certain, a small number of infinitely changing pieces to create all of this. And that's a pretty incredible insight. Now, from those original planetary impulses became the concept of the planets as gods or the planets as guiding spirits. Eventually down into the Catholic Church, they renamed them angels and gave them angel names, but it still gave the flavor of that we live in a hierarchy of being. And then that hierarchy, we step down from the all oneness all the way down into physical manifestation. Uh, hello, Pat. Oh, happy birthday, Pat. Yay. The planets are all smiling on you today. That's awesome. Okay. So from a magical point of view, then if you consider that the planets are like the crayons that God uses or spirit uses or the source uses to color all of reality, you can understand the magician's keen interest in learning how to work with the planets when doing our own magic, because you're basically borrowing God's crayons to color your own world. In essence, you're using the tools of creation to make things manifest. And how much more potent is that than just making it up as you go along? So this is where we get each one of the planets associated with all of the many correspondences of the world. So let's summarize. Um, Jupiter and Saturn are a pair. Jupiter moves us down on the vertical dimension into physical manifestation. And so Jupiter gets associated with everything that moves us down and becomes more, more physical and tangible. So its color was black. It was the dimmest and furthest away. It had to do with limitations because that's what happened. The more dense you get, the more limitations you experience. Um, and all stones that are black, uh, plants that have black seeds and so on. Things that are, it's also associated with the ending of things because that's a, another kind of limit. So anything that poisons you. So there's a logic to that. Jupiter is the planet that moves us up on the vertical dimension, closer to spirit. And so it's everything that moves us up, that makes us feel bigger, that makes us feel more connected to the divine. Um, Jupiter's color, alchemically speaking, was blue in, in uh, the Indian tradition, it's kind of a yellowy orange color. So stones that are blues and yellowy oranges were associated with Jupiter. So there was a very, very consistent logic that went along. So just like Saturn and Jupiter are, are, are opposites in the way they move energy, uh, Mars and Venus were the same way. Mars separates and moves us apart. Venus joins and pulls us together. And they had all of their plants and minerals and colors and everything associated with them. The sun and the moon were polar opposites because sun, big and bright, makes things all light. Moon, dim, changeable, brings things down to earth. Moon even had a special position in the planetary hierarchy because it was the closest to the earth. And so it sort of babysat or guided all of the other planetary energies and funneled them down here to earth. It's why pagans today still do rituals for drawing down the moon uh, because it was the last piece that you could connect down to physicality. Well, you can draw down the energies of all the other planets too. And the only planet out of the, those colors that we missed was Mercury, which wasn't really missed. Mercury didn't have, Mercury was special in the sense that his job was to link together all the other things. So he was more of a linking agent between the different levels and between the different polarities. So he was his own opposite. He contained both. That's why we called him a hermaphrodite because he contained the elements of the complementary opposites. All right. So it was actually very simple. And once you understand that, you can understand the way the ancients venerated the planets, gave them God names. And we still have echoes of that today. I mean, the reason there are seven days of the week is because there are seven visible planets. The reason why years later, you know, Isaac Newton decided to name, decided that there would be seven colors of the rainbow. Well, because there were seven planets and he wanted to give every planet a color. He thought that was thematically appropriate. I tend to agree with him. So 
once you recognize the way the ancients thought about the planets, that they were guiding spirits, the seven governors of the world as the Corpus Hermeticum talked about them, you can see how potent those ideas came through in our Western tradition. I mean, we have adjectives associated with each of the planets. We have jovial for Jupiter because it means Jove, who was the, uh, the uh, Roman god of Jupiter. We have Saturnine for Saturn. We have martial, you know, martial law for Mars. We have venereal for Venus. We all know what venereal gets associated with. Um, we have mercurial for, for uh, Mercury. We have the lunatics for the moon. So they're even down into adjectives that we describe the essence of things, or at least the way that they behave. So one of the biggest steps that magicians learn as they're working with their magic is to truly internalize and embody what the energies of these seven planets mean. Because it is literally the language between the planets and Kabbalah. These are the languages in which all spells are written. So if you know Kabbalah and you know what the planets mean and how, and how they energetically relate, you can decode every single spell in all of these books back here that people have made up over the ages. Because almost all of them rely on those two key ingredients in which to write a technology for kind of hacking the universe. Um, and so we begin to realize that magic, when you want to make something man manifest, it's basically like making a decoy here on Earth or a guide wire. So that, let's say you want to manifest a new car, right? And you know you want your new car to be a certain color and be able to do certain things, um, certain price range, whatever you want. And you want to create a vision for this car so it manifests in your world. And you want to have some anchor so that you've got your clear intention and you want to funnel that energy down into the new track that manifests that car. Well, you can use planetary correspondences for creating the spell to attract that car and that physical 3d spell acts as the anchor point to hold all the energy that you're using to direct to what you want to create it's not quite that simple but that's a, that's a really good start so maybe let's say you want a let's say you want a white pickup truck having done this for myself one time you might want a little bit of help from the moon if you want it to be white a little bit of help from Saturn if you wanted to be a truck because it's a work vehicle. A little bit of help from Mercury because it drives from place to place. And anything that helps you connect, Mercury is going to like. And so you've got your planetary team, and you're going to honor them in the spell and the ritual that you do by adding their colors, by adding their symbols as you recreate an image of what you want to make manifest. And then charge it up with your own, your own oomphiness and ask the spirits to do the same. That is the essence of magic in any tradition you look at in the world. You know, they use slightly different allies in different parts of the world. But in the Western tradition, those allies are almost always planets. So just having this conversation, I know many of you who are listening and tuning in have astrological backgrounds. You might not have ever thought about your astrology this way because in our very modern culture, astrology gets associated with astrology charts and not always with its magical side. But its magical side came first. Its magical side was the reason why astrology charts were later created. And having taught lectures in different pagan circles, have taken pagans out in the woods for retreats, I'm very well aware that many people who call themselves witches and pagans don't want to have anything to do with astrology, especially astrology reading charts, because they think it's too hard. And explaining to people that there's a huge power in the planets to relate to the planets as gods of different things sets off all kinds of light bulbs. Realizing that there is, once you befriend the planets, once you make them your own on an interior level. Once you use your ability for your guided visualizations to tap into their essence, 
can move you in ways that's very difficult to describe if you haven't experienced it for yourself. They open up all kinds of doors. No astrology charts required whatsoever. And so I highly recommend anyone who's starting on a magical practice who's not used to thinking about the planets this way. I mean, anybody who is doing um, Indian astrology, traditional Jyotish, already knows this. They're like, wait, you Western people, like, you don't think this way? <laughs> we must sound like lunatics to someone who's grown up with this kind of culture of representing the spirit that's inherent in our astrological practice. But I have heard, I have heard so many people who call themselves professional astrologers or astrology enthusiasts who say things like, oh, they heard I was an astrologer and they didn't want to talk to me anymore because they thought I was going to like cast a spell on them. And how could, I mean, they, they clearly didn't know that astrologers don't do that. And I just, I want to bang my head on something. And I'm like, yeah, maybe astrologers who call themselves astrologers today don't do that. But that's not because they can't. It's because they don't realize the huge tradition that's standing behind what they are just scratching the surface with by only dealing with the astrology as shown on a particular astrology chart. So feel free, if you're tuning into this and you disagree with me, please yell at me, I don't mind. Um, that's what the comments are for. <laughs> but I would challenge you that I have done reams of research on this subject. It's all this information that I've just told you is out there. It's really easy to find if you know where to look. Starting with, you know, the simple places like the Course Hermeticum, if that's a simple place. <laughs> <laughs> it's a simple place to me. I don't know if it's a simple place to everybody else. All right. So what have we learned today? We have learned in the 15 minutes that we have spent together that moving from above the one to below the many, the planets sat in an interim position there, stepping down the divine information into all the myriad possibilities of, that we see all around us, all the plurality, all of the infinite diversity. The planets are responsible. They're interactions one to another. And getting to know them is like getting to know how to use the cosmic crayons, so to speak, so that you can color your world, that you can create events in your life that pull your energy down or lift your energy up or send your energy out or bring things towards you or learning how to stitch the various sides of the equation together. They are the best friends for anybody who wants to create a spiritual practice and is already doing astrology. They are just waiting, waiting there for you to stop thinking of planets as intellectual constructs and start talking to them as if they are the spiritual presence, the potent experience of living spirit that they are. So I hope for your homework today, just take a minute, maybe have a little conversation with the planet that feels most relevant to your life right now. Maybe you're feeling a transit, or maybe there's a planet you've always been felt close to. Sit down, imagine in your head that you can have a little conversation with them. And you know what? If you don't know how to do that yet, I will be back tomorrow and I will give you some hints on how to use your active imagination which is a fancy way of saying create and hold an altered space within you in order to begin these kinds of dialogues with your inner world and the spirits that are all around us that are here to help us in physical manifestation. Okay? All right. Any questions on today's little mini lesson? I know some of you who are tuning in have already taken my planetary magic course where I go, planetary magic, the art of ritual, where I go into details about how to do work with all the planets for yourself. Um, Planetary Magic, The Art of Rituals has, um, it describes what plants and stones are associated with each of the planets, goes into lots of detail in their mythology, what uh, gods and goddesses are associated with it. But the most important thing it does is it gives you guided meditations for working with each to find out what they feel like for you and instruction on how to use them to build your own rituals 
so that you can begin to create the world that you want to create. There are like 36, 37 sample, sample spells written into that course to give you a head start on the process, but also like training on what the elements of ritual include. Okay? So you can check that out. But you don't have to go, you don't have to be like an expert to just start the conversation. All you need to do is close your eyes, be still, and open up the possibility. Pick a planet and have a conversation. Uh, Jackie says, Bahaha, feeling Mercury station on my ascendant and very newly progressed moon in Gemini. I am busy. Well, good. Mercury can be hanging out with you, having a conversation. It can teach you how to be busy, how to how to loosen up, how to not get attached, how to find common ground. Mercury is good at all of those things. Anything else before we go? I let you type. Don't forget, if you've got any friends who are interested in magic, feel free to share any of these videos with them. Invite them to the crossroads so they can tune into the group. This is like a little mini 25 a mini 15 minutes a day but by the time i'm done this is going to be a 25 hour course on all things magic so that's a lot of time um but 15 minutes at a time can make a huge difference in your life and just showing up begins to show your intention to create a more magical life Uh, Althea says, once I confused the time for greeting a certain planet and I got the impression that the door was locked, I did not realize I was wrong until the next few hours. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Uh, we will talk about that soon, that astrology charts were originally designed so that you could identify when the planets, each individual planet would be open for business. That's why we created astrology charts. Um, there was a great, I don't know if anybody saw it, there was a great article on CNN um, yesterday, the day before, uh, talking about they had finally found a breakthrough in growing a certain kind of coral um, that's super important for the coral reefs off the coast of Florida um, that have never been able to uh, grow in a, in a lab before because they could never get them to propagate. And they tried everything they could think of. They like had LEDs making artificial sunrises and artificial moonrises and nothing worked. People were like, well, you just can't do it. Well, this, uh, the latest attempt realized that their calculations for moonrise were three hours off. So they fixed the moonrise error and all of a sudden the plant, the coral started spawning for the first time ever in, in artificial conditions. So think about that. There is this ast astrological principles of the importance of the timing of things like moonrise can be essential to unlocking what scientists have been puzzling for about for a really long time, simply because they refuse to admit that such things can matter. And yet the evidence that they matter is all over the place. Anyway, I, I found that story very, very amusing. I'll dig it out and I'll see if I can post it here because somebody else might find it as amusing as I did. <laughs> So Alfia, you and the, and the scientists at the lab growing in the coral had the same experience. Apparently the door was locked for those corals. They couldn't spawn until the moon was at least in the right place. The light of the moon was in the right place. Super cool. <laughs> All right, everyone. If you've got no other questions, I'm going to go for today. Remember, I'm going to be back talking about uh, using your mind, using the equipment we all came pre-installed with, our imaginations, in order to hold space open for the possibility of deeper communication with our planetary allies. Until then, I look forward to continuing our conversation tomorrow. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.